You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to the brand new Drone U Studio. As always, my name is Paul. And my name's Rob. Hope you like it. We're really excited to be here. Even more excited to be back in front of you and hanging out with you guys. And as always, we appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with us. We greatly do. And uh, if you're wondering, uh, we actually, we built this whole thing uh, all by ourselves. It's been a little help from PJ. Yeah, a little help from PJ doesn't hurt. So... (laughs) We are very grateful to be here. As always, thank you again for joining us. We've got a great question uh, today. Don't forget to send in those questions. Ask DroneU.com. Uh, today's question is brought to you by our Props Commercial Roof Inspection course. That's right. We uh, we went way down the rabbit hole with Optellos and some of our good friends. If you're looking to really score on you know money making jobs good money making jobs in commercial roof inspections we essentially worked with an industry partner to create a simplified and efficient workflow of capturing data to create 2d maps and 3d models so that roofing inspectors adjusters estimators and contractors can utilize the data to make much better decisions on, you know, the the work that needs to be done. They don't have to essentially travel to that site as many times, reducing the costs involved in that. But also they're able to create a permanent record of installation and make better decisions on where logistically to put materials, assets, and whatnot. Even helps to create a safer site. If you wanna check it out, go to propsflightschool.com and under courses, you can see CRI or commercial roof inspections. I don't want to miss it. Hey guys, my question is regarding the new surge of FPV consumer level drones that are coming out from obviously DJI. So I witnessed a video the other day of Wrigley Field being shot by what can you know be assumed a Cine Whoop FPV. And while there are creative edits in there, there's a lot of questions regarding how could they get away with this legally to shoot from beyond visual range. There's no way a spotter could have seen all of what's going on and remote spotters aren't being allowed to be used. Obviously they, they have permission and they figure out how to do it. I'm just wondering if you guys have any insight into how these type of operations go and also commercially, how can you operate an FPV in a manner similar to these guys outdoors and uh, still be legal? Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate the question, Tom. Great question. And, uh, definitely something to make sure you get right. Yeah. And I think we should, I'm going to try to, uh, go ladder to the former as far as questions are concerned. Um, the, the first question regarding how can they fly outside and keep it safe? Obviously, if they've got goggles on, um, FAA has actually made this really clear that anytime that you do have, uh, anything that would obstruct your ability to see and avoid, or as I've said many times, seek and avoid, um, they make it really clear. You're supposed to have a visual observer to keep eyes on the bird the whole time. So very clear as far as what you're supposed to do. Now I've, we've shot these fly through videos as well. We did one with the isotopes baseball team and we're very familiar of the difficulty in setting up the different flight paths and being able to maintain visual line of sight. So for example, in our isotopes video, I was sitting right inside of the pro shop, able to see the drone from the outside flying in, at least my VO could see it. And then essentially I was pushed in a wheeling chair out towards the uh, dugouts and my VO was with me the whole time. So there may be things going on behind the scenes that you may not be aware of because there are ways to comply, but it does bring up another important issue that when it comes to these Cinewhip videos, if they are flying inside, there is no FAA jurisdiction. I think that's important to note. Now, that said, can you get a waiver just like Lance or an airspace authorization to fly in these areas? Yeah, you absolutely can. In fact, 
Albuquerque had changed the airspace back when we were still there. And I had to get a wide area authorization uh, because I guess they had moved the area that we wanted to fly into a zero grid. So that said, I'm not sure if you know, in those applications, if they are seeking enough detail and information of like, you know, are you flying a Sinawa? You're going to have a VO because we never had to answer those questions and we were in contact with them directly. Yeah, I would imagine they're not that sophisticated at this point in terms of what they're asking. I think in part they're trusting the pilot, right, to be, I don't know, forthcoming and yeah, let, let it be known what they're actual actually trying to do. A hundred percent. And, you know, I think a lot of people have seen me and others that were once affiliated with us make the mistake of playing uh, drone police because I think it's just a, a total waste of time. And honestly, in, in regards to, you know, these videos, some of them looking illegal. I mean, you see stuff all over the Internet and Instagram every single day. Um, and, you know, with flight over people coming, you know, next year, we're less than a year out away from that. I wonder if the FAA really even cares or if they're allowing people and this, this strategy might even be outside their purview, but maybe they're allowing people to get comfortable. And then when remote ID flips on, they're going to automatically see right away who's doing what. So, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I would be surprised if that uh, sinister plan is in effect. (laughs) However, you never know. But the other thing about it is a lot of the videos that we're seeing, they may not even be in the States, right? They're Uh, from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's obvious that it's not the States, but sometimes it's not. Yeah. And I mean, people even claim sometimes that they have the waivers to do this stuff and they may and they may not. Um, But honestly, it doesn't matter because uh, it's just a waste of time. At this point, we've kind of reached the point of assuming the best, giving people the benefit of the doubt because there's nothing we can do about it anyways. A hundred percent. And honestly, if someone does something unprofessional and they get in trouble for it, they get in trouble for it. And that's that's the end of it. So, yeah. And if they get away with it, well, they took the risk and they won. (laughs) <laughs> I guess, you know, I don't know. Uh, I guess that age old Not adage, that we're encouraging that. But no, 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 no. Definitely not. I guess that age old adage of ask for forgiveness definitely comes into play here. Well, yeah. I mean, given what little enforcement there's been, I mean, you kind of almost have to... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Assume that's well, going on a lot. You know, and in regards to the remote ID stuff and the FAA being able to see these drones, all these DJI FPV drones, the Avada, the DJI FPV, etc., those actually can be seen by a lot of the remote ID um, hardware slash software. And I don't think that that's actually really well known. In fact, if many of you remember, we put out an article a year or two ago about all the drones that would be remote ID compliant. And if you remember, FAA came down on us and was like, don't, don't say that. Don't say that. And they wanted us to change uh, marking and registration, whether your drone was remote ID capable or not. And they're like, just answer no right now. It's like, well, why would you even put the damn question on the form if you guys aren't capable of handling the data yet? You know, it just kind of seems erroneous. Either way, they came back, uh, what was it? A th- I think three weeks ago where they announced all the drones that are already remote ID capable. And every single drone we put on that article was on the list. So <laughs> we're definitely light years ahead of, uh, uh, of the FAA. I mean, that was apparent too with part 107, but I digress. Yeah. Anyways, um, I guess you can do your best. There are those situations that I'm curious about. It's not that big of a deal, but as a bit of a continuance of the discussion, somebody's flying indoors, but they go outdoors just a little bit, but their primary focus is indoors. Well, what would you, would you worry about that? Well, see, and this is something that I was hoping would get flushed out with the, uh, lawsuit on remote ID and what is truly navigable airspace. Yeah, yeah. Cause you ask any pilot, okay, if you're flying a helicopter below the tree line, is that really navigable? Or below airspace? the roof line in yeah, this it, case. Yeah. Is that really navigable <laughs> airspace? And oftentimes the answer is no. And so, I think that particular issue, my opinion, I'm not sure is very valid here. And I wouldn't want to give an opinion that people are like, well, Paul said, blah, blah, blah. I think that this issue still has yet to be fleshed out. Um, I think what is navigable airspace and, you know, FAA says, well, from the blades of grass and to the heavens. And it's like, well, we know that that's not true now uh, because there's something called the space force. And I think they're controlling the heavens part that the <laughs> FAA talks about. So, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, that's a really, really fire point, Rob. And to answer your, your question, if someone was, you know, doing mostly inside and then they ended up outside at a low altitude, say below the roof line or below trees, I'm not 
I, I'm not worried about it. I'm just put it that way. That's yeah. my opinion. That's not the law. Uh, the law is very clear. At least they say that it is. Um, <laughs> so, uh, wow. Regarding what the FAA does control. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that we're just going to keep seeing challenges to these laws. I mean, I will say in the remote ID challenge, I really wanted to get Brendan or Brendan, Brendan, Brendan from Race Day Quads on the show to talk about how the judge was like, this is a digital license plate system, but we're you know, that you're not inherent to having privacy. And it's like, well, wait a minute, as a driver with a license plate, I have inherent privacy. You know, if I cut off Rob, Rob can't go look up where I live. You know, he can't go look up, you know, where I stop and stand and enjoy a nice cup of coffee and be able to accost me. So I guess I could follow you. Yeah. And I mean, I guess maybe remote ID will turn out kind of like the CB radio law where everyone is supposed to register their CB radio and comply with all this stuff and no one ever does it. So it might just be one of those laws on the books uh, that people just uh, may not comply with. And I say that too, you know, for all those regulators, like, where are you getting this intel? Well, go look at some of the emails and the newsletters coming out of uh, places like dronehacks.com, where they're mm. saying that their number one requested feature is to remove remote ID broadcast. And you also have individuals who are creating remote ID broadcast modules who were literally also a part of the rulemaking process, which is a direct federal, uh, um, it's a direct federal violation of an NPRM lawmaking or rulemaking. There's a clear conflict of interest, but yet no one seems to be caring or talking about that. And so again, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to something that we've talked about a few times, which is, you know, lawmakers can create laws and rules at the end of the day. It's society who determines what is enforceable at the end of the day. I mean, like, and I always give the example of cell phones, right? How many people do you see driving and they're on their cell phones? And it's oh like illegal gosh. everywhere, it's right? It's more than you don't see. Exactly. Nowadays. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, mm, we'll see where this goes. I mean, I will say my personal opinion on remote ID is this. I have no issue broadcasting my position and the drone's position to law enforcement. I definitely have an issue showcasing my position to the public. That is something I just won't do. I won't do it. And someone texted me the other day and they're like, yeah, Mavic 3 just went through a remote ID test and they were showing that only the drone's location and position comes up, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, when you allow any DJI remote or app to say, yeah, you can use my location or not, you might be able to block the functionality of showcasing your location or you might not. Um, either way, uh, I just don't want to be one of the guys that runs into a problem out in a rural area and now you are are the um you they, are they're going hunting mm -hmm, you're the subject now <laughs> of some investigation because something bad happened to you or like, that yeah i just i don't want to see that happen i know a lot of other people don't want to see that happen and i feel like it's a a major uh, overlook in the legislative system to be honest i mean i want to bring that judge onto the show and ask him like did you consider this whole idea of a digital license plate do you ever think it's analogous to license plates on a car? You know, do you ever get uh, cut off in traffic? Do you ever get super pissed at that person? Well, you can't go look up where they live, you know? So it's like, but with the drone, they can see exactly where I am. Yeah. And I'm like, how is that a digital license plate system, you know? And uh, well, it's, it's a, I suppose you could say it's a redefined version of a digital license plate system. It's, it's not the exact same, but it's a version of is why you could say that just to be devil's advocate. Well, I think I have an answer. If, uh, if I were ever accosted by an FAA person, they, and during a period of remote ID and they said, why weren't you not broadcasting your location? And I would look the guy deeply in the eyes. Deeply? <laughs> You're assuming he's looking you in the eyes, but go ahead. Yeah, I would look the guy deeply in the eyes and I would say, sir. I identify as a drone. <laughs> so that's, I'm, that's what I would say. I mean, I can't wait I for think that it's, to happen. I think it's politically correct, right? I think that just because you said that, they're going to come follow you around and wait for that to happen. <laughs> well, we'll all get some entertainment then. That's so right. uh, we're going to keep the, the GoPro rolling. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that said, I don't want to cause problems with the FAA, no, but of course I want not. We're I on their side. 
A hundred percent. But I also want to poke the bear and say, hold on a second. Is this truly creating safety in national airspace? Because I think it's a very easy argument to say your number one goal, according to Congress, is to keep the national airspace system safe, period. Well, how does this keep this safe? I understand on the drone side. I just don't understand on the pilot side. So here's a th- here's a thought. So my wife's teacher, when she starts a new year of school, she goes in and she starts at like her harshest approach to discipline, for mm-hmm. example, right? So she goes in real tough. And then over time, she can reel that back depending on how they respond and if they behave, as opposed to trying to go the other direction. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's what they're doing. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I will say that some of my favorite teachers, that's kind of what they did. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's really hard to discern what's really going on in D.C. at the FAA office. (laughs) That's Uh, not just the FAA office. Woo! Oh, don't get me started. (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah, we we all know the stories there. Well, and I think also there's always this uh, recurring theme with government that there's an implementation of rules and then kind of a cutting back. And it's kind of like a, a calibration period, I guess you could say. And frankly speaking... Um, I think that there is going to be a calibration period. I mean, there are so many instances too, where, you know, you take your wife out of school, right. And, um, they're having issues with privacy with kids or whatever. Let's just, just, just throw out hypothetical here. Which is a thing. Yeah. It is a thing, right? And uh, you saw that flying from my house with the right drone, I can literally zoom in to read license plates three ish miles away. Okay, if there was a remote ID system at the school trying to capture data, we we do know the limitations of those systems and whatnot. Would they even be able to see a person who is flying many, many miles away causing problems? I think that, you know, the whole idea with regulations is that they're supposed to have um standards, uh, performance based standards in creating these regulations. And I'm just not sure that remote ID is there. And I mean, all, all, also, everyone knows I'm not a big fan of remote ID to begin with because they've always said, we need this because drones are dangerous and there's going to be drones everywhere. And it's like, okay, well, we're in the tens of millions of drones now. And how many issues? Okay, I can count them on two hands. Hmm, that's statistically an anomaly, but, you know, we're pretty safe. That's why it was easy to well, put out the article of the, we're the safest pilots of any generation of pilots. <laughs> well, and that's true. Although, I mean, staying ahead of the curve is not a bad, um, a bad goal. It's always the how, right? We talk about that all the time. <laughs> but yeah. I think the and idea the about staying ahead, it is, it is. It's challenging, especially with something like this, with uh, such a, an ever-changing and quickly changing technology that does affect airspace um, logistically, right? Yeah, 100%. So it is a thing, um, but... Yeah, hopefully, I don't know, in time, these things work out usually. That's why I say the calibration period for sure. Yeah, for sure. um, In regards to Cinewhips, though, in regards to uh, uh, how to do it legally, if you're flying Cinewhip or FPV, you are supposed to have a VO no matter what. So all that to be said, make sure that you have your VO and uh, fly safe. Make sure your line of sight or your VO is line of sight. It will make for some interesting um, logistics, I would say, and some planning. But, you know, if we didn't have those things and these jobs wouldn't be challenging and they wouldn't pay well, you know, so. So didn't we, we put on YouTube the how-to video of the isotopes video, right? Yeah, we did. So do you talk about that? Do you uh, kind of a little bit about this? I believe we do talk about it. So. Yeah, because that's like a 10, 12 minute video. It is. Yeah, it's fairly long. Yeah. So you might check that out. Um, it's on YouTube. And it's like a how to, how we did the isotopes shoot or something. Yeah. 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 It's like behind the scenes, isotopes and a whoop or fly through. Right. Check it out. But that's going to do it for us today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us. Please send in those questions, askdroneu.com. And I uh, hope all of you are still members. We've got a lot of new courses coming out. We've literally shooting like six DCCs this week. So all new drones, M30T, Wingtra is getting on there. Oh man, what we've learned about that Wingtra is amazing too. So make sure to check it out, but that's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You.